Today was the day for Chile to start his appeal, the denied motion in his federal sue the state of Nevada and everyone else action. The denied motion was something Chile filed in June, trying to stop the criminal case from proceeding. He gave kind of a rambling story about how his life was in danger if it were to proceed. Not much made sense, so the judge denied it a few days later. The real reason has nothing to do with safety. After all, Chile had joined a black prison gang the last time he did time. Oh wait, that right now he claims he's never had a criminal record, so whatever that meant. Anyway, today was his presentation of excuses and fairy tales to the Ninth Circuit Appellant Court, trying to get the denied motion overturned and the criminal proceedings stopped. The reason still has nothing to do with safety, as I've mentioned a few times and will again. It's simply because if he's found guilty of these two misdemeanor charges, his civil suit, which is based on that incident, ends up being dismissed, and Chile gets absolutely zero settlement money. So let's look at the law scholar's work in court today. What gets submitted is a multi-part form. It asks for specific information and tries to guide the applicant. Remember, Chile is not actually there to speak, so this is all the court gets and sees. The first part is the info and the actual appeal starts at page two. So part two is facts of the case, as imagined by Chile. And there are a few goodies in here. Although I made no overt action to interfere with any investigation happening, and I was standing in a place where Bork could easily keep an eye on me for safety reasons, Bork asked me to step back, which I did significantly. Now, if we look at the video, Chile is standing about 10 feet away from the officer, which is about a third the distance for safety. And I did a previous video showing just how fast someone can cover 30 feet when attacking with a knife. 30 feet is the distance that they train cops to back people off. That's the safe distance. I'll insert a link to that video now in the upper right hand corner. Needless to say, Chile didn't back up significantly or at all, but flipped out and was st telling the little doggy to move along and go do his job. Next, we have Chile stating that this is contrary to what Police Protective Association training dictates, which is also kind of strange as they really don't have anything to do with the training syllabus of cops. Then Chile asserts that the officer charged at him or charged toward me, intent to unnecessarily manhandle me, and he did unnecessarily manhandle me. Bork called for backup, and with the support of his supervisor, I suffered excessive force and battery from Bork and his fellow officers, which has left me with lasting nerve damage. I was subject to subsequent unlawful arrest, unlawful search and seizure, and unlawful abuse of power. That's just an awful lot of unlawful there, isn't it? Again, if we watch the video, Bork calmly walks up to Chile and tells him he's detained, at which point Chile starts darting around like a chicken in the yard at feeding time, and Bork stands there until Chile swats and grabs at Bork's arm. And that's really when the fun begins for this. Now, if you follow Chile before, you notice that anything he emits vocally or on paper revolves around spouting off either his feelings or some unrelated case law. But it's always kind of light on facts, like the following. I suffered excessive force and battery from Bork on his fellow officers, which has left me with lasting nerve damage. If there were any truth there, he would have had a few medical reports and a report from a medical expert. Even a general practitioner, aka your family doctor, can order a nerve conduction test to determine if there's any nerve damage. Does Chile refer to notes? Nope. Does Chile refer to any doctor's report? Nope. And somehow, he also never mentions any testing. But he goes on to expect the court to believe he has permanent nerve damage. This is followed by him stating that the facts that he was essentially charged with quote unquote contempt of cop and says at no time did he obstruct the cop's investigation. When a cop has to spend more time keeping an eye on Chile than the person in a car right beside him who could easily have a gun under the seat or in the glove box, that's the textbook example of obstruction. 
And on top of things, Chile even takes a dig at the judge by whining that he could no longer get a fair trial because the judge handling the criminal case has stated, I need to lower my expectations on what discovery I will get from the state due to it only being a misdemeanor case. Now, it's funny how that will make sense to a reasonable person. After all, this isn't a murder case. It's a damn ticket and a fine for being a jackass and getting in the way of people trying to do their job. This is followed by, I fear that my criticism of police misconduct will end up getting me killed should the malicious prosecution continue in such an illegal manner. And now he's back to the worry about me because my feelings said so kind of facts. And the next section is where they asked Chile, what did he ask the court to do? Chile replies, I asked the court to stay the criminal proceedings which were brought maliciously against me for the only purpose to chill my rights and where the malicious prosecution would harm me and I had a reasonable fear of additional excessive force based on the record. The court denied the injunction even though it had not been opposed. Chile goes on to explain how the one hearing before the judge was irrelevant. The court had incorrectly applied Younger Doctrine, doing this by not interfering with the lower court in progress. And Chile states that the court didn't know how to deal with a misdemeanor case with possible jail time. Now it's funny, I thought almost 100% of misdemeanors could get you a few hours or more in jail. And the insinuation that the court is clueless about them is kind of on the insulting side. Chile also tries to make a pretty weak claim about his video not being used, but unless he gives them the raw, uncut version, it's not admissible as evidence. Remember the highly edited video Chile submitted to court during a suit against Massol, and how the defense submitted the unedited versions? This is followed by the judge watching the unedited video in court, with Chile trying to constantly get the judge to skip past certain parts several times. He annoyed the crap out of that judge enough to get admonished a few times by doing that. I wonder if Chile was trying to edit the truth out of his videos. Nah, that's nothing a 20-year-old law scholar would do. So yet again, hardly any chance of this question causing Chile some blowback. Okay, now to the next section. What legal claims did you raise in court? My complaint raised claims of 4th, 14th, 1st Amendment civil rights violations. Battery, unequal protection, assault, false arrest and imprisonment, invasion of privacy, negligence, and Monell claims for policy practice, supervisor liability, and failure to train. Okay, these claims should have been stated in the case, but if you notice, Chile is also trying to insert a couple of new arguments into this appeal. Unequal protection, protection from what or whom? He's the only one there. This is actually new. False arrest. Okay. Invasion of privacy. How? What? Why? What the fuck? I assume he's referring to asking for his ID? Maybe getting touched when they searched him for weapons? After he got arrested? It's hard to tell because he never says why. For example, asking for ID is not an invasion of privacy. Once they are under arrest, you cannot withhold it. That's just soft set PS that Chili pulls out once in a while, if you noticed. This is also new. Negligence. What? When? Where? Did they drop him on his head in handcuffs? Don't think so. Monel claims. Okay, at no point has Chili stated a single fact about how the training was deficient and how they affected him on that day. Monel is just a method used to enable you to sue cities for unconstitutional practices that lead to an incident and actually harm someone. Maybe he's getting back to saying his skin color is the wrong one again. So overall legal claims, there's nothing, nada. But here he expects the court to take the extreme action of overruling a lower court case in progress based on the presented facts, or lack thereof. The next part is my favorite. Section 5. I have to read this out in total. Exhaustion of administrative remedies. For prisoners, did you use up all administrative remedies for each claim before you filed your complaint in the district court? If you did not, please tell us why. Julie's response. I am not a prisoner. Yep, that's all he says. This section is the court actually just asking if he had followed all the proper paths of actions. Hint, nope, he bypassed a few that he should have done first. 
This is asked of a prisoner, as the court recognizes a prisoner might have restricted access to case law, lawyers, and may need to bypass a few things. Chile bypassed everything as he realized the guilty meant no payday, and the only thing that could get him away from the judge that rule denied was a new court, hence this appeal. Section 6. What issues are you asking the court to review? And Chile ignores reality and asks the following. Should a court refuse an injunction to stay a criminal proceeding brought illegally and in bad faith to chill a person's rights and to harm that person in retaliation for exercising their rights? Chill, chill a person's rights? What the fuck legal mumbo jumbo is this? Note the criminal proceeding brought illegally and in bad faith BS solves its special words. I think Chile has to kind of prove the proceeding was in fact illegal and not just pretend it was because his fifis got hurt yet again. Does younger apply when civil rights are involved and the person hasn't been charged? Let's go and actually read what younger says. Younger abstention, named for younger v. Harris, 401 U.S. 37, 1971, is less permissive to the federal courts, barring them, stopping them, from hearing civil rights tort claims brought by a person who is currently being prosecuted for a matter arising from that claim in state court. Kind of sounds like Chile's case, doesn't it? A federal court will not hear the case until the person is convicted of the crime. The doctrine has been extended to state civil proceedings in aid of and closely related to state criminal statutes. There are three exceptions. When the prosecution is in bad faith, i.e. the state knows the person to be innocent. Nope, Chile's guilty as hell. Or the prosecution is part of some pattern of harassment against an individual. The Las Vegas Metro PD had zero idea who Chile was before this started, so nope. Three, where the law is being enforced is utterly and irredeemably unconstitutional, i.e. the states were to make a law making it a crime to say anything negative about its governor under any circumstances. Well, this sort kind of means if Chile runs for governor, then our, our governor is an idiot sign is perfectly legal. Then Chile asks, should the court sua sponte, on its own accord, assume and infer facts in support of the opposition of a preliminary injunction, even when those facts are contrary to the declaration by the movement, the applicant, and no opposition or proof has been raised by the other party, especially where the preliminary injunction would stop irreparable harm to a plaintiff and his civil rights. When video is offered for proof of likelihood on winning on merits, does the judge need convincing or only a reasonable jury? This is a real good circular argument, just goes in circles and doesn't actually ask him. Chile is asking if the courts should infer facts that do not support his case because it may be contrary to what Chile said. Makes no sense. No one ever lies, especially Chile. Again, Younger Doctrine has nothing to do with the active case and its fact, or fiction in Julie's case, but it's just a rule to prevent courts from waiting on other courts, stepping on other courts, or interfering with their operation. And again, he's trying to push that video. I also did a video that shows all 28 body cam videos put up against Chili's original unedited video. Originally, Chili did a live stream of, for the arrest, and a few hours later, he did another live stream, but somehow the video had already been altered. Luckily, the original was safely recorded by quite a few people. Should a court fail to follow its local rules for an emergency reconsideration and wait two months for a ruling, even when all procedures were followed by the movement? Again, this is a misdemeanor case. It's not an important criminal case. It's not election fraud or something that is important to decide. Tilly was told, basically, it was a misdemeanor case, so sit down, shut up. And that got his fifis hurt yet again. And then Chile says, These questions must be answered in the interest of justice. No, they don't. Either that or ask ask cruel questions. Not try and insinuate additional imaginary facts, Chile. Question 7. Did you present all issues listed in question 6 to the district court? Answer yes or no. No. I raised all except for I did not have the opportunity to raise the delay of the emergency motion or the factual analysis of the video, which should have been determined on whether a reasonable jury 
could find for the plaintiff, not on whether a judge is convinced, which I now raise as trial court error on appeal. So, yeah, more word salad, or my brain is already wobbling from all this exposure to Chile. It's kind of hard to tell. Chile is saying he raised all the issues, but didn't have time to raise all the issues because he didn't have the opportunity. Okay, the motion was denied on June 12th, and he filed this appeal August 14th. So he had 32 days to file something or made an amendment to the issues into this dumpster fire that's his case. And he's also complaining about having a judge instead of a jury now when he's the one that asked for it. Chile has filed amendments prior to this, so how hard would it have been to do this? Or maybe just because it was because he was getting busy spanked by the Ironton court again and didn't notice. I'm not sure how not looking at the unreliable video evidence is trial court error. If Chile had submitted it to the court, it would have been considered, and Chile would have had to explain the video. And as soon as the first obvious edit occurred, it would have been tossed anyway. For some reason, the video was never submitted as evidence. Perhaps the version Chile wanted submitted conflicts just a bit with the live stream version. Question 8. What law supports these issues on appeal? Now, Chile goes on to cite eight different cases and tries to cite only Ninth Circuit cases, thinking that that will have more sway than using something that is actually applicable that he thinks supports this appeal. The problem is, as always, he skimmed or searched for a phrase and then just copied and pasted that in. I'm not going to go over all of these, but let's lightly look at just one, the most important one, Younger v. Harris. Chile's argument, and I quote it exactly, is, and this is all of it, this applies here. That's it. Younger doctrine is essentially non-interference of one court with another. The idea is that the courts operate independently of each other and are not waiting on some proceeding in this system to have an outcome before they can proceed with their own stuff. You can imagine how fast the court system would move today if they had to wait on each other. I think that approaches the definition of forever. If Chile actually was the law scholar he claims to be, he would know that this one doctrine, and this doctrine alone, is the only argument he had to win, and yet his only response, argument, or whatever it was stated, this applies here. Okay, there are two more questions dealing with pending appeals and then previous decided cases. And Chile, in the absolute most stunning thing imaginable, answers correctly with no. And that answer was about the only win he got today.